Here we go. And let me share my screen. Okay, so we're on page 103 of the Koran, uh, right at the top of the page, I believe, at the red S. Yeah, let's see if that's still, I don't know if you can tell page. Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech olam shekichanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Just a second. Uh, when I share a screen, it's harder to see who's waiting to come in. Okay, so um, just said the bracha for those who uh, who just came in. We're on page 103 of the Koran edition here. Let me uh, make it a little bit bigger. And here we go. Okay, so we're going to get to a new Mishnah shortly. So we had a lot of Midrash uh, on the prior pages. Uh, but now uh, one last topic from the Mishnah, which had been about whether you can, as a Jew, participate in the construction of non-Jewish buildings, especially when you know that there's going to be a room set aside in that building for idol worship. So the, the top of the page, the Mishnah teaches one may build with Gentiles small platforms and bathhouses, but once he reaches the arched chamber in the bath where the Gentiles put up objects of idol worship, it is prohibited for a Jew to continue building it. Rabbi Elazar says that Rabbi Yochanan says if he did continue to build the arched chamber, his wages are permitted. In other words, right, you're you're doing the building not out of the goodness of your heart, but you're getting paid for this. So the arch chamber apparently is where the idol worship would take place. So, so uh, the anonymous opinion says you're supposed to stop construction. Then you can't can't be paid for anything. Beyond that, but Elazar, in the name of Yochanan, says if you did if you did continue to build, you can you can keep the wages for that. Okay, so now uh, there's a halacha on this, so it's on the right hand side here. It is permit prohibited to join Gentiles in the construction of an arch chamber that is designed to house objects of idol worship. If one did build it, his wages are permitted. Some authorities rule that even if he built an actual idol, his wages are permitted, as indicated by the Gemara here. So we're going to get into that. So imagine imagine if Jews were involved in the building of Notre Dame Cathedral. So not just, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of statues there, and, uh, and there's also lots of statues that are uh, anti, uh, anti-Semitic. So you wonder then also about... Uh, about that. So, um, you know, just a question for these are Rabbi Rama, Rambam medieval rabbis dealing with building mosques or churches, Jews engaged in that business, and whether they're, they're permitted, because there's, uh, I don't know, I don't think you'll, you'll find any statues in mosques, that mm -hmm. there is artwork, but not statues, but there are plenty of statues in churches. <clears throat> so, the question then is about those statues. Are they considered idol worship, and are you allowed to do that? So I, uh, I thought you, I, I thought you said that, um, or we said that, uh, Catholic Christianity is not idol worship; it's right. atheism. So right, why would a Jew? So that way, I mean, yeah, a um, if you don't know uh, enough about Christianity to know that it's not idol worship, it looks like idol worship. So if you're a rabbi in a Muslim country and you've never seen a church in your life, you might not know uh, about uh, what uh, what to make of the big statue at the front of the uh, of the uh, of the davening space in, in the church. Big statue there and lots of other statues on your way in. It looks like idol worship. And, you know, you'd have to be an educated rabbi to know. <laughs> that it's <clears throat> that it's just a representation, one, <clears throat> not an not an idol. One would hope that the phrase "educated rabbi" is a tautology. 
<laughs> uh, right, right. So, uh, but, and it was. Uh, in other words, uh, rabbis in the mid Middle Ages knew enough uh, from the sources that they were reading um, to, to be aware that Christianity was not idol worship. So we're back here in the text. The Gemara asks, isn't that obvious that you're allowed to, con co to continue to collect wages? After all, such arch chambers are only accessories of idol worship. And with regard to accessories of idol worship, both according to Rabbi Ishmael and according, uh, yeah, I, I just have a note here telling me that my internet is unstable. So I apologize ahead of time. I was trying to connect to the internet that's more stable right here, and it wasn't letting me do that. So hopefully the internet will will last. Um, so uh, after all, such arch chambers are only accessories of idol worship. And with regard to accessories of idol worship, both according to Rabbi Ishmael and according to Rabbi Akiva, who disagree with regard to deriving benefit from an actual object of idol worship, deriving benefit from accessories of idol worship is not prohibited until they are worshipped. So in other words, the arch chamber, even though it's meant for idol worship, until the idol is put in there, it's just an accessory. So there's nothing wrong then um, uh, to, with a Jew being fully involved in constructing that accessory, whether it's the platform on which the idol is going to go or the chamber itself in which the idol is going to go. Okay, so there was a halachic note here, accessories of idol worship here on the right hand side. An idol of a Gentile is forbidden as soon as it's built, whereas it is prohibited to derive benefit from an idol of a Jew only after it has actually been worshipped. With regard to accessories of idol worship, whether of a Jew or of a Gentile, they are prohibited once, only once they have been used for idolatrous purposes. So the accessories uh, don't count until they're actually used for idol worship. So you okay. can't buy, buy um, in an antique store uh, an eye, a saint statue and maybe, I don't know, bury it in the ground for two weeks the way you would cash or a with the old thinking of Hadakasha. Well, first of all, the saint again is not an idol. It's a it's a it's a means to focus one's Christian thoughts on Christian prayer. Okay? So in other words, you're not directing prayer to the saint himself in the form of an idol or herself. You are using it to help focus your uh, spiritual energy on the particular kind of prayer you want to say, right? So that if those Catholics who have St. Christopher medals in their cars, you know, it's to uh, St. Christopher for the saint for travel. You're not praying to the saint to protect you from travel. You're having the saint help you direct your thought to your Christian God to have a safe trip. Okay. So you couldn't buy a, um, a, 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 a what do you call it, an antiquity? A, 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 you could, you could buy a, we, oh. like an issue, and it had been used for for idol worship and a share or something. Well, oh, you couldn't could, own one. Could you own? Could you own something that had been an idol that isn't an idol anymore? So, in other words, like uh, Steinhardt, this wealthy Jew who. Um, <clears throat> I think was uh, accused and um, for um, buying antiquities and dealing in antiquities uh, unlawfully. Um, so let's say he had a Canaanite Baal in his possession. Um, could he? Could he have that? Yeah. So I think. Uh, nobody worships Baal anymore, so it's not it's not a current idol. But it, it, it had, it, had it, been, but it uh, but there's nobody around to worship it anymore. So I think it's just a relic. So I think it's okay oh. to own to own an idol after the fact. Yes, Phil. Hi. Um, just curious about you know you talk about uh, Catholicism or Christianity. Uh, I know in 
the Hindu religion, they have some statues. Yes. Are those idols or that's similar to Christianity where it's so no, no, those are idol. those are definitely idols. And okay. um yeah. So let's say uh there are a number of Indian restaurants around that are a hundred percent vegetarian, right? So which might not have kosher certification on it. So I've been to such restaurants and eaten in them. So there are representations of of Hindu uh, gods all around the restaurant, uh, whether painted on the wall or um, or in statues as you walk in. And there would be some there would be some Orthodox Jews, let's say Orthodox Jews who wouldn't require the rabbinic certification in order to eat in that restaurant because they can they they know that the uh owner the proprietors and the chef are pretty uh strict i was going to say the hebrew equivalent is machmir they're pretty strict about being vegetarian um and for their religion they need to be vegetarian so you can trust them but might not eat in the restaurant because there are idols all around so uh, it, it's this that are they are are people actually in the restaurant worshiping these idols? I'm not sure at the time that the restaurant is open and they're serving food that people I, I've been in there. Nobody's stopping to bow down to the to the to I don't even know the names of these gods that are represented on the wall. Nobody's bowing down to it. Uh, but are are you contributing to idol worship? by uh, giving money to the restaurant. And again, I don't think so either uh, in that case, but are you allowed to attend, let's say, I don't know, Diwali, right? I don't know what that is, but it's uh, something with all these colors, these colored powders that are thrown around for some kind of celebration or whatever it is. You know, the newspaper uh, talks about these Hindu festivals. Are you allowed to attend them as a Jew I, I don't think technically, according to this, you shouldn't be doing that because that's definitely idol worship. Um, they are the, the celebration is a celebration of the God, whatever God it is uh, for that particular celebration. And that's active idol worship that's happening. So technically speaking, it shouldn't a Jew should not participate in that. So now. The, yeah, the, the, the the bigger question, though, Phil, is that this chapter is is teaching about is what's wrong with idol worship? OK, so in other words, um, you know, in this day and age, when you can have you go to college and take a, a contemporary religions class to learn about all of this. Right. So I, I bought the Bhagavad Gita when I was in college. To, as part of my contemporary religion class that I took. So there's nothing wrong with learning about it. And it's and it's quite the opposite. I would encourage people to learn about as much about other people as possible so that we can appreciate one another. But uh, I think in the rabbi's time um, uh, that we're reading here in the, in the Gemara and before that in the Mishnah and before that in the Torah, idol worship was uh, the equivalent of idol worship is murder. So in other words, for the rabbis, an idol worshiper is a barbarian, is a an evil person. And um, that idolatry then for the rabbis is understood to mean um, evil. So that part, so that um, uh, contributing to, um, you know, doing business with a Greek or a Roman is uh, is antithetical to what it means to be a good person, because the Greeks and the Romans were no good, um, and they were they were perhaps a bit more civilized than Canaanite idol worshippers or Egyptian or Babylonian or Assyrian idol worshippers, but when it came to their uh, ethics, their ethics sometimes like crucifixion, torture, 
uh, other things like that, that was seen as evil and barbaric. And I think that's why uh, that that that's probably at play here with these laws against idol worship. Now, you could argue that the medieval Catholic Church is evil and barbaric as well with the Crusades. And some some might argue not to try to try to stay away as much as possible from the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. You can make that argument too. Yes, Zella. Um, well, I appreciate you talking about um, um, why Jewish religion doesn't like idol worship because I I never understood why. We're so against, uh, you know, we tolerate yeah. other religions, but we're so against idol worship. But um, my question was that um, when my kids were in high school, I chaperoned a trip to um, a Hindu temple mm. and we were told at the time that it was a monotheistic religion. So, um, uh, so I don't know, even, it, even though yeah. I read, read the Bhagavad Gita, you know, it was a survey, it was a survey class about other religions. So what we spent a week or two on Hinduism, so I really don't remember. Uh, it's possible that all of these uh, celebrations within the Hindu religion are all uh, manifestations, uh, multiple manifestations of a single Hindu god, but I am not sure. Uh, I think Michael might be Googling it right now, if any of you want to Google, uh, is Hinduism monotheism? Maybe you can come up with a quick answer to that. I'm not. I'm. I'm not so sure. Uh, it's. Uh, it's possible that Buddhism is monotheistic, but Hinduism is not. But again, I'm not. I don't know. I don't know enough. But, but I would also argue, even if it is idolatry, I. I would think that. It's not just about the that it's not monotheistic. It's more about what kind of person is this idolater. And if the if the idolatrous religion is teaching murder as part of its religion, then that's what you need to stay away from. So Greeks and Romans, had murder as part of their culture. So I think it's that that the rabbis are so actively against. And the fact that Romans murdered rabbis, tortured and murdered rabbis also would be, you know, uh, it's it just proof for the rabbis that the Greek and Roman idolatrous religion is is a murderous religion and therefore we want nothing to do with it and we don't want to do business with it. Okay, so uh, Rabbi Yirmiya says, uh, Rabbi Elazar's statement is necessary. That is that you can collect your wages even if you have completed the accessory uh, only to permit the wages of a Jew who built an object of idol worship itself. The Gemara asks, this works out well, according to the one who says that an object of idol worship of a Jew is forbidden immediately once it is built, but it's not prohibited to derive a benefit from an object of idol worship of a Gentile until it is actually worshipped. In this case, the idol was built for a Gentile, and therefore the laborer may receive payment for his work, as the idol was never worshipped. But according to the one who says that an object of idol worship of a Gentile is also forbidden immediately, what can be said? Rather, Rabbi, Rabbi Bar Ula says, Rabbi Elazar's statement that the workers' wages are permitted is necessary only with regard to the final stroke, with which the laborer completes his work. In the case of an object of idol worship, what causes it to be used for idol worship? It is the completion of labor. And when is the completion of labor achieved? It's achieved with the final stroke of the laborer. The final stroke alone does not have the value of one pruta, and therefore the wages he receives are due when each act of labor is performed during the entire process, not when the final stroke completes the work. Evidently, Rabbi Elazar holds that the obligation to pay a wage is incurred continuously 
from the beginning of the period he was hired to its end, and not merely upon completion of the work. Since the worker has rights to his wages at every stage of labor performed during the entire period of work, the wages are not considered a benefit that he receives from idol worship, as the object is classified as an object of idol worship only at the very end. Right. So I think we had this discussion a few weeks ago. You know, what uh, when you hire a contractor to renovate your bathroom, you're paying, even though you might pay, you might pay something at the beginning, uh, good faith that you want the, the contractor to do the work. You might not pay until he's all done at the very end. But the idea is you uh, you haven't. Um, you're you're paying him for all the work that he's not that he's done, not just for that last stroke of paint to complete the work in the bathroom. Okay, so the so in other words, you're the, um, let's say you pay ten thousand dollars for a renovation of a room. You know the the final stroke of paint wasn't worth ten thousand dollars. It was all the work leading up to it that was worth the ten thousand dollars. So, yeah, Michael. And the idea being that as the work's being done, the value is being accrued. Right. I wonder, is there anything that is that has utterly no value unless it's completed? I can't think of anything. Does something okay. have value and uh, no value until it is completed when it then has value? What's that? Cake. A cake. A cake. Uh, right. You're not, you don't want, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, but You're if not paying I for dough. Yeah, but if I don't finish cooking the cake, you can always take it and give it to someone else to cook. Maybe. So there's, there's value in the work I've no, done but so it, far. But you're paying the baker. Uh, let's say you pay ahead of time a baker for a wedding cake. Uh, that oh, wedding okay. cake isn't a wedding cake until it's, it's a still wedding still cake. Done, yeah. Right. Yeah. So well, in other yeah, words, if the baker says, well, here, I, I did half the job. I mixed the dough. Yeah. I just didn't put it in the oven, but something came up. And now, I don't know, I can't finish it, but you owe me for this dough. I don't think anybody would say that I owe any baker any money until that cake has the uh, bride and groom on top. So, or bride and bride or groom and groom, <laughs> uh, whatever it is. So, they and right. They. So, right. So, okay. So, okay. yeah. So let's go on to the next mission. And one may not fashion jewelry for an object of idol worship. And this applies to jewelry such as necklaces, katlaot, uh, from the Latin catella, meaning ne necklace. Okay, so this applies to jewelry such as necklaces, nose rings, and rings. Rabbi Eliezer says, if one fashions them in exchange for payment, it is permitted. Ah, so in other words, let's say a, uh, an idol worshiper wants a necklace, but he doesn't say what the necklace is going to be used for, right? And so you're just paying the, a jeweler to make a necklace for you. And what the, what the idol worshiper does with it after he pays you, uh, does, it's not your concern. Okay, so if one fashions them in exchange for payment, it's permitted. So, uh, right, I'll look at the note in a second. Let's finish the mission. The mission returns to the issue of selling items to Gentiles. One may not sell to a Gentile any item that is attached to the ground, but one may sell such an item once it is severed from the ground. Rabbi Yehuda says it's not necessary to sever the item from the ground. Rather, one may sell it on the condition that it be severed. Okay, so let's look at these two notes here. For payment, it is permitted. So Tosafot, these are the grandchildren of Rashi. So they're on the same page, the traditional page of the Talmud. Rashi's on the inner margin. Uh, the Tosafot are on the outer margin of the page. Tosfot, among other early commentaries, questioned how Rabbi Eliezer could deem it permitted to fashion adornments for idols. They state that the Mishnah should be amended so as to delete the ruling of Rabbi Eliezer. In fact, in the version of the Mishnah presented in the Jerusalem Talmud, his ruling does not appear. So it's just, it's just interesting then that there was a debate among the 
the uh, early commentators as to whether this is actually permitted or not. Uh, and then you can't sell an item unless it's severed. Um, since the reason for this prohibition is to prevent Gentiles from acquiring property in Eretz Yisrael, it's not applicable in the case of detached items. Therefore, the sages did not extend the prohibition to such items. Can right. an example of, the, of a severed item? Um, so maybe something that is, um, oh, it could be a tree. Right. So trees were worshipped for idol worship. So maybe if you cut down the tree, then it's you can't it can't be worshipped anymore. All right. And therefore, it's also not connected to the ground. So you're not selling a piece of land of the land of Israel either to an idol worshiper. Yes, Zella. Okay, this is a side question. So they're talking about jewelry for an idol. So the nose yeah. rings made for a statue, but I have seen nose rings mentioned in the Torah, I believe. Yeah, uh-huh. So I thought that piercing was not allowed. Right, religion. so it depends. Uh, it depends on your uh, Jewish religious tradition. So my mother uh, does not have pierced ears. Uh, and could not understand why we wanted to pierce our oldest daughter Ellie Sheva's ears when she was two. So um, from her from her perspective, that was not uh, proper. So it depends which part of uh, Jewish Europe uh, one stems from for that. The reason why it is permitted to pierce right. So. Um, where we're told about nose rings. I mean, uh, I think Rachel, mm -hmm. Jacob's wife, Rachel, had a nose ring. So how was it attached? That we don't know. So, you know, those who don't have pierced ears can still have earrings. There's some kind of clasp there that uh, kind of, um, I don't know, uh, some kind of uh, spring thing that it makes it stick to the ears, stay on it. So maybe a nose ring is done the same way. But... Uh, maybe it's pierced. So, you know, um, the lobe, if you pierce the lobe uh, and then uh, take the earring out or just don't do anything, the hole closes up. So because it's not a permanent hole that you're making, that's why some some authorities permit piercing. Um, so e ear piercings and nose piercings are okay. The question would be the cartilage. There, you know, there's some, there's some people today that have tons of jewelry in their ear, not just on the lobe, but on the upper part, all around. So I, I don't understand it, but anyway, I don't think those holes close up. I, I'm not sure. So uh, technically, you're not supposed to make a hole that's going to be uh, permanent. So, because it's similar to tattoos, uh, you, sh you shouldn't, uh, it's not our body to do with it what we want. It's on loan from God while we are alive. And so our body needs to be returned uh, when we die in the same condition in which we got it. So that's, that's the idea. So, yeah. Um, okay, so um, now the Gemara on this. The Gemara asks, from where is this matter that it is pro prohibited to sell to a Gentile anything that is attached to the ground derived? Rabbi Yossi Bar Chanina says, the source is that the verse states, you should not show them mercy, lo techonem, which is understood as meaning you should not give them a chance to encamp in, that is to acquire land in Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so techonim, they're taking, uh, so you have to, if we look at the Hebrew, lo te, oh, so lo techanim. So chana, so the, the root of that is chana, which is a girl's name, chana, Hannah which means grace, okay? So don't give them grace. Don't show them grace. But 
they're understanding it here spelled the same way to let them camp. So machane is a camp. So it sounds like it's the same word, but it's uh, technically speaking, it's not the same word. But you could understand it for the for the case for the sense of this halachic midrash interpreting this word um, that don't give them a foothold, a camping hold in the land of Israel. So the Gemara asks this phrase: "You should not show them mercy." Isn't it necessary to teach that this is what the merciful one is saying? You should not give them favor by praising them, right? Can't you say that this is the halachic teaching here is you shouldn't praise idol worshipers as opposed to understanding it to mean don't give them a piece of the land of Israel. The Gemara answers, if that were so, let the verse say lo techu name with a vav, lo techu name, with the letter vav, as then it would be evident that this is a form of the root chet vav nun, which means favor. What is the reason that the verse instead states, states lo techa name without the letter vav? Conclude two conclusions from it, that one may not praise them and also that one may not allow them to acquire land. So we're learning two things from this, not, not just that you are not allowed to um, uh, compliment them, but also you're not allowed to let do business in a way that they would acquire land. The Gemara asks, but still, isn't the phrase, you should not show them mercy, necessary to teach the halacha that this is what the merciful one states, you should not give them an undeserved gift. Maybe, maybe it means don't give them something for free, because the word for free is chinam, right? So it's still, you got the letter chet nun mem right here, meaning chinam, if you put the vowels this way, whereas if you put the vowels this way, it's chanem, okay? So, right, remember that they were looking at the Torah without vowels. They had the accepted way of how to read it, but they... They also understood, hey, maybe we're supposed to read it a different way and learn something else. So maybe we're supposed to read it low. We're supposed to learn about not giving them a free gift. The Gemara answers, if that were so, let the verse say, lo techinem. So to spell it this way, with a yud in there, what is the reason that it's spelled without the letter yud? As lo techanem. Learn from it all of these three halachot. So now, just because of the way it's spelled, without the yud, without the vav, meaning with the vowels you can put in to make it pronounced in a variety of ways. So we're learning three things. Don't give them a foothold so they can camp in the land of Israel. Don't uh, be nice to them. And also don't give them anything for free. Okay. So this is also taught in a Brita, you should not show them mercy. This teaches that you should not give them a chance to encamp in the land of Eretz Israel. Another matter, you should not show them mercy. This indicates that you should not give them favor. Another matter, you should not show them mercy. This teaches you should not give them an undeserved gift. Okay, so uh, not just here in the Gemara, but they're also quoting a Brita, from a source from the time of the Mishnah that says the same thing. The Gemara notes, and this issue of an undeserved gift to a Gentile is itself a dispute between Tanaim, between rabbis of the Mishnah, as it's taught in a Baraita, you shall not eat of any unslaughtered animal carcass. You may not give it to the resident alien who is within your gates, that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, for you are a sacred people to the Lord your God. I have derived only that it's permitted to a resident alien through giving and to a Gentile through selling. From where do I derive that it's permitted to transfer an unslaughtered animal to a resident alien through selling? The verse states you may give it or you may sell it, meaning that one has the option to do either of these. Okay, so Jews can't benefit, uh, Jews themselves cannot eat this animal carcass, but uh, why let it go to waste? You can, for somebody else who doesn't have the same laws, you can give it to somebody else or sell it to somebody else. 
The Baraita continues, from where is it derived that it's permitted to a Gentile through giving and one is not required to sell it to him? The verse states, you may give it that he may eat it or you may sell it to a foreigner. Therefore, you may say that he may transfer it both to, to both a resident alien and a Gentile, both through giving and through selling. This is the statement of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda says these matters are to be understood as they are written. One may transfer an unslaughtered animal carcass to a resident alien only through giving and to a Gentile only through selling, as it's prohibited to give an undeserved gift to a Gentile. So there's a difference between resident aliens, they are non-Jews who are living within your community, and Gentiles. So they may be living in your community too, but the difference is that a resident alien is living closely within the Jewish community proper and therefore has to act like a Jew. Whereas a Gentile, also a non-Jew, might be living in your same community, but has no interest in acting like a Jew, want to maintain their own separate lifestyle. So there's a difference between a Gentile and a resident alien. So a resident alien is one step above a Gentile in that they're acting like a Jew, uh, but haven't gone through the formal conversion process. So there's Gentile, resident alien, and then convert. Those are the three categories of non-Jews, but convert, you know, shouldn't be called a non-Jew, they have non-Jewish origins, but then they become uh, fully Jewish, as opposed to a resident alien who is only acting Jewish. So the acting Jewish, the resident aliens, are responsible for certain things, but you can't count them in a minion, and you can't, um, they're, they're not fully, um, they're not full equal participants in all matters of Jewish life. Uh, so therefore, like, this about the carcass, they can they can they can possess the carcass and do what with it whatever they want because they're not Jewish. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, um, yes. The, are we differentiating Gentile and idol worship, or does Gentile include idol? A uh, Gentile is uh, for the rabbis. Gentile is a is an, an idol worshiper. Worship. Okay. Mm. And, when we're talking about uh, what's growing in the ground that we can't sell to a Gentile, we're talking about outside Eretz Israel. No, I think they're I think they're talking about land of Israel. Ah, okay. Yes, yeah, Marlene. Okay, so um, yeah, just my question is, um, so does a re resident alien have to like participate in the holidays? Right. So, um, right, that's a question like about Passover. Can a resident alien sit at your table, at your Seder table? So according to the Torah, no. Uh, let me just look at Exodus chapter 12, uh, to where that law uh, is presented. Uh, just one second here. Um, uh, it was the first day of Pesach Torah reading. All right, so resident alien, if the resident alien is circumcised, then the resident alien can participate in Passover. If not, no. That's what, what that's what about a what female if, resident alien? <laughs> uh it depends. I was just talking about Passover. So about other matters. Um, it, it depends on the particular law about how how much so a, a resident alien has to on the outside act Jewish, but on the inside doesn't have to. But they get okay. So right. So if a resident alien just happens to work for you, then they can't work for you on Shabbos. But if they have off at home. They can do whatever they want in their own home. But in your home, as, as a resident alien coming into a Jewish home, they have to act Jewish. Okay, so that's somebody who works for you. But publicly, publicly, they can't, uh, a resident alien has to look Jewish. Even though on the, on the inside, what they do in their own home, they don't have to. Okay? Um, okay. Okay. Uh, 
Right, the Gemara comments. Rabbi Meir is saying, well, as the verse indicates, that either method is acceptable. The Gemara explains. And Rabbi Yehuda would have said, could have said to you, if it enters your mind to understand the verse in accordance with that which Rabbi Meir says, then let the merciful one write, you may give it to the resident alien who is within your gates that he may eat it. And also you may sell it to a foreigner. Why do I need the word or between these two options? Learn from it that it comes to teach that the matters are to be understood as they are written. The Gemara asks, and how does Rabbi Meir explain the wording of the verse? The Gemara answers, that word or teaches that one should give precedence to giving it to a resident alien over selling it to a Gentile. And Rabbi Yehuda holds that since you are commanded to sustain a resident alien, as it is stated, and he shall live with you, and you are not commanded to sustain a Gentile, there is no need for a verse to teach that one should give precedence to a resident alien. All right, so that's how we understand the wording of the verse, precedence to a resident alien, and then to a Gentile after that. Okay, we can go on a little bit more. So now, it is taught in the Brita, cited earlier, another matter, you should not show them favor. This teaches that you should not give them favor by praising them. The Gemara notes that this supports the opinion of Rav. As Rob says, it's prohibited for a person to say, how beautiful is this Gentile woman? The Gemara raises an objection from a Baraita. There was an incident involving Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, who was on a step on the Temple Mount, and he saw a certain Gentile woman who was exceptionally beautiful and said, how great are your works, O Lord? Right, so he's quoting Psalms, Ma Rabu Ma Secha Adonai, uh, when he sees a beautiful Gentile woman walking by. And Rabbi Akiva, too, when he saw the wife of the wicked, wicked Turnus Rufus, he spat, laughed, and cried. He spat as she was created from a putrid drop. He laughed as he saw, foresaw that she was destined to convert, and he would marry her. He cried as this beauty would ultimately be consumed by dirt. All right, so we're having a uh, midrash here about uh, whether we can, uh, right, uh, so there are just personalities there that uh, that we're alluded to here. Um, so uh, so there's just midrash here about whether it's, it's okay to say nice things about Gentiles or not. So Shimon ben Gamliel seems to be uh, quoting a uh, Bible. Psalm says, how beautiful of your works, O Lord. That means you can praise, um, you can praise Gentiles, but uh, Rabbi Akiva, uh, not so fast, but then realize, realizes in a fit of prophecy, when he sees this woman, that uh, she's going to end up converting, and then also end up dying, so that's why he uh, spat, laughed, and cried. So now, and how would Rav explain the incident involving Rabban, Shib Rabban Gamliel, who praised the beauty of a Gentile? Remember, Rav says you can't do that. The Gemara answers, Rabban Gamliel was giving thanks to God for creating such beautiful people rather than praising the Gentile herself. As the master said, one who sees beautiful or otherwise outstanding creatures recites, blessed be he who has created such in his world. Right. So in other words, you're not praising the actual person, you're praising God who has created uh, wondrous, beautiful things all around the world. Okay, so now, but is it permitted to gaze upon a woman? Right? Why should Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel have even spent the time noticing to, uh, that she was beautiful? The Gemara raises an objection from a bright that a verse states, and you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. This teaches that a person should not gaze upon a beautiful woman, even if she is unmarried. And a person should not gaze upon a married woman, even if she is ugly. And a person should not gaze upon the colored garments of a woman. And a person should not gaze at a male donkey, at a female donkey, at a pig, at a sow, or at fowl, when they are mating. And even if one were full of eyes like the angel of death and saw from every direction, it's not permitted to look. 
right? So we're not, a, so uh, the a pious person should not be looking around a lot. You don't want to be tempted in any way by anything that could be distracting or could lead to evil thoughts. Now, so the, like, uh, so full of eyes, like the angel of death, they said about the angel of death that he is entirely full of eyes. When a sick person is about to die, the angel of death stands above his head with his sword drawn in his hand and a drop of poison hanging on the edge of the sword. Once the sick person sees him, he trembles and thereby opens his mouth, and the angel of death throws the drop of poison into his mouth. From this drop of poison, the sick person dies. From it, he putrefies. From it, his face becomes green. So this is the rabbis explaining how people die. That at that moment, uh, the the mouth is, I don't, so I've been to hospital rooms where people have died, and it is very common to die with your mouth open. So I think that this is a midrash about that. Why is the mouth open? Ah, uh, Maybe they've just seen the angel of death, and the angel of death, that sight uh, causes the mouth to be open in shock and allows the angel of death to drop the drop of poison in to complete the process of death. Uh, you know, it's uh, to talk about how people die, why people die. It was the rabbis had to understand that moment in a in a Jewish religious way, and this is the their their way of explaining it. Yes, Bess. Um. Uh, I'm stuck on, was it Rabbi Akiva who married Tufus Rufus's, whatever? Yes, uh, yes, yes. What, she, they divorced or he, he died? Uh, Tufus Rufus, Turnus Rufus. So Turnus Rufus here in the personalities. Turnus Rufus refers to the Roman governor Quintus Tanaeus Rufus, who ruled Judea at the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt which he depressed with great cruelty. For this reason, he was dubbed Turnus Rufus, a deliberate distortion, distortion of his name, alluding to the phonetically similar Greek word for tyrant, Turanos. As related here, he engaged in theological debates with Rabbi Akiva, whom he later commanded to be tortured and killed. It's related in Tractate Tani that he also ordered the plowing of the sanctuary as a symbol of its utter destruction. That's all we know. <laughs> I thought Akiva marries the wife. Yes, but there's nothing, nothing there to um, in the story. To uh, all I know about Rabbi Akiva's wife is that he married the daughter of this famous person, uh, this wealthy person, Kalba Savua. Um, right. And I, so I don't know. I don't know this story about him, about who, uh, who this wife is. So I don't know, and the and the Gemara is not ex the notes aren't explaining it here. So you can you can Google it on your own and see uh, Rabbi Kiva and wife of Turnus Rufus. Uh, okay. So now more about explaining Gamliel. And the, I uh, blind people. What's that, Bess? I was going to say blind people. Then they wouldn't die, according to this. They wouldn't be able to see the angel of death and open the mouth. This is. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I'm I don't know. I don't know what blind people see in their head, uh, in their minds, in their mind's eye, uh, but it's it's there's that too, right? The the uh, a, a person is not seeing the angel of death. This is the rabbis explaining it. So the Gemara answers. Rabban Gamliel did not intentionally look at the woman. Rather, he was walking around the corner, and he saw her unexpectedly as they each turned. So that's how, God forbid, Ramban Gamliel is looking at women. Uh, this is the way to explain this story. It was unexpected. Uh, but then again, there shouldn't be anything unexpected when it comes to a rabbi of such great stature. You know, if you're coming up to a corner, never know what's going to be around the corner. Better have your eyes down and not looking up. So, but, um, yes, Marlene? So, isn't that also, um, we in Pirkei Avot, the rabbis also said, uh, you know, who's the strong one, the one who 
uh, what, covetous row. So yes, he right. had some inclination for something that's supposed to, you know, be able to uh, overcome it. Right? right. But this is, <laughs> but this is a rabbinic debate, you know, how, um, yeah, if you're courageous enough to overcome your evil inclination, that's great. But for most people are not able to do that. So better not to put yourself in a situation in which you're confronting your evil inclination. Better to, to not have any distractions at all so that you can uh, have a better chance of uh, of doing good. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. With regard to the statement in the Brita, nor may one gaze at the colored garments of a woman, Rav Yehuda says that Shmuel says, this is a halacha even if they are spread on a wall, not only when they are being worn. Rav Papa says, and the prohibition applies only when one knows their owner. Rava said the language of the Brita is also precise as it teaches, nor may one gaze at the colored garments of a woman, and it does not teach, nor may one gaze at colored garments. Learn from it that the prohibition applies only to the garments of one he knows. Okay, so in other words, that, right, so uh, I don't know. You see that 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 famous picture of Marilyn Monroe over the subway grate, right? So with that white dress, at least it's white because it's a black and white picture. So if that's on display in the Smithsonian, maybe you'd be thinking about that picture and be thinking things about Marilyn Monroe that you shouldn't be thinking about. But if you don't know whose dress it is, it's okay to look at it, right? There are other dresses in the Smithsonian of Queen's and uh, people that are not familiar to you from history. So it's okay to look at those because nothing, it doesn't make a connection in, in your head to anybody that you know that would then lead you to have thoughts that are not appropriate. So interesting, interesting idea. Um, let's stop here for today um, at uh, Rav Chista. Uh, I'm just making a note uh, where we are. Uh, uh, page, uh, page 106. Okay, so we will continue next time. Oops. Uh, yeah, we'll continue next time and uh, next Sunday. Uh, I think we have, uh, yeah, there isn't, we will, we will meet every Sunday now until Memorial Day weekend um, because uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. So I think so uh, we we're, so uh, so we're gonna end our classes will end the the Sunday before Memorial Day weekend because there there are one or two Sundays in June that I'm not going to be available. So uh, our Talmud class will end for the year on that whatever that Sunday is. Is that like the 18th or something like that? Uh, whatever that day in May, that will be our last Sunday that we'll have class. But I'll I'll send that out with the recording today uh, for the schedule for the rest of the year. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. By what we did.